everyone again welcome thank you for attending measure what matters using case as your linchpin i'm very pleased today to welcome quite a slate of guest speakers to our session those include donna baharich chair of the texas state board of education adam blum uh, from open ed and act company and booth from houston isd joshua martz from public consulting group monica martinez from the texas education agency greg nato from public consulting group keith osborne from the georgia department of education and brant red from smarter balance assessment consortium and I'm Jill Hobson. I'm the K-12 Institutional Program Manager, along with my colleague, who you heard earlier, Kara Jenkins, Director of Marketing Communications here at IMS Global. And today we're here to talk to you about Competencies in Academic Standards Exchange, or CASE. CASE is a, one of our technical standards, and it is a standard that helps drive teaching and learning. It is involved in all aspects of teaching and learning and helps align curriculum, frameworks, it aligns learning standards, and it can help connect digital resources to those curriculum. It also helps recognize learner achievements as well. You'll be hearing today from two state agencies that have begun the process of converting their standards, their learning standards, from the traditional format of publishing standards, the PDF format, and making those into formats that are easier to update and provide changes, and also to help ensure that um, the way in which those standards are published is machine readable and doesn't become interpreted by other um, inst entities on the way to being machine readable. So the challenge for districts can be that they want to be able to have standards aligned digital content from a variety of providers. And all of those providers may be using different ways of getting learning standards into a machine readable format today. Then as they bring those standards aligned digital content and the um, achievement data associated with that standards aligned information into their platform, the learning data doesn't align up. There isn't a one way to bring it together. And that's where CASE can come in and help solve the problem. And so we talk about this universal framework that helps align the learning standards, and we talk about how CASE really fits in to all aspects of teaching and learning, because learning standards fit into all aspects of teaching and learning. The CASE becomes that, that way of flexibly being able to represent all of the learning standards and the competencies, the rubrics, and the relationships. And you'll be hearing from a variety of our, our state agencies who've done the publishing. Then you'll be hearing from organizations that have been able to benefit from those machine-readable standards and how they're able to make resources available for others to use and even new techniques for being able to search for resources as a result of those standards being available. So we transform those learning standards from the static document into a universally read format. We provide frameworks for rubrics as well that can be transmitted right along with those learning standards. And we can create relationships among standards. And here's where a lot of the power of CASE is available. So we can begin to have learning progressions. We can also be a, have the ability to create relationships between different sets of standards. We have the ability to provide lots of, in, lots of new ways of representing information about what's going on with competencies as well, breaking down the standards into more granular information. So now as we begin to hear about the ways in which CASE is being used, I'm very pleased to be able to turn over the presentation to the Georgia Department of Education and Public Consulting Group so that you can hear about 
how they've done the process of converting to CASE. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jill and Kara. Uh, my name is Greg Nadeau, and I'm a manager at Public Consulting Group, where I lead our blended learning team. You can go to the next slide. Uh, PCG is a consulting company headquartered in Boston um, with over 30 offices and 2,000 consultants across the country. And so we're committed to working with states, districts, and service providers to support open learning environments that leverage uh, date weight, uh, uh, linked data web services, open standards, and open source technology. So we came to IMS Global um, almost three years ago to ask to help lead um, what's become case out of our experience with two clients, the New York um, uh, Engage New York project and the Houston, Houston Assessment project. In both cases, we were directed to use an existing provider of, of data and uh, academic standards and to integrate with the learning registry. In both cases, we saw market failures and the need for a new trusted service. So that, combined with my colleague Joshua Mark's long career with OER and Cricky and LRMI, led us to conclude that we were missing key enabling technology to unlock the power of OER and blended personalized competency-based learning. So we brought these ideas to IMS Global and developed what emerged a couple years later as CASE. Um, and we've been leading the development of, helping to lead the development of CASE, Open Salt, and the announcement of the 50 state CASE registry a couple weeks ago at Learning Impact. You can go to the next slide. So you've heard from Jill why CASE is necessary. And so without CASE, you understand that academic standards are not machine readable. And so there's just lots of inefficient um, expenditure of time and lack of comparability. This real lack of comparability, the no common index that makes um, prior OER and learning registry type work uh, frustrating in order to be able to discover content across jurisdiction lines. So, however, you know, case is critical, but not sufficient. Uh, we believe that there are two other connected enablers needed in order for this market uh, correction to occur. Um, Number one is an easy use to use near free technology. And number two is a trusted registry. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so SALT, the standards alignment tool, um, we built and uh, we developed in collaboration with ACT and School City. And it's a true open source collaborative development where um, we all contribute code um, and all work together. Um, we use this tool to test case data from states, higher ed, and workforce sources like ONET, um, Department of Labor. And we worked with Safari Montage and HMH, ACT, and School City, and others to test case data in SALT to ensure that the information model is sufficiently extensible and robust. You can get a last slide there for me. Um, so we decided to issue uh, SALT under the least, possible, the least restrictive possible license, an, an MIT license. Um, as evidenced by our commitment to sharing, um, I note that two of our current competitors are using OpenSALT in their offering. And while that's kind of challenging to explain sometimes inside of PCG, you know, it's this new type of more open competition based on quality and trust instead of proprietary software and data um, that, we are, that we want. Um, so I will now turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Keith Osborne, the Associate State Superintendent for Georgia Virtual. I've been proud to work with Georgia over the last 12 months to use CASE to enable open learning technologies as was recognized with this IMS Global Learning Impact Platform Board. So, Keith? Thank you, Greg. Uh, Ms. Kerr, you want to go to the next slide, please? Keith, you actually have presenter control, so you can navigate through the slides. Okay, there we go. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Keith Osborne. Uh, as Greg said, I'm Associate Superintendent for Georgia Virtual Learning. Uh, and I work directly with curriculum instruction as well as with teacher and leader support and development teams. Uh, and we make up the teaching and learning division of the Georgia Department of Education. Uh, my deputy superintendent is Dr. Caitlin Dooley, uh, and she answers directly to our state school superintendent, Richard Woods. Uh, one of the components of Superintendent Woods' Vision 2020 plan calls for our DOE to provide 
of what we call Georgia Island and Georgia Grown Standards and that we also ensure that students and teachers have equitable access to high quality instructional resources and support. To kind of help with this endeavor, uh, we've been discussing ways to leverage learning technologies as a means to kind of change the culture and workflow of our organization to work systematically together and certainly to maintain a higher degree of fidelity for the standards and resources that we create. Uh, and by the way, Georgia is one of the 20 growth in states, and so all the materials that we create are published as OER. Um, because teaching and learning identifies the what to teach, which are the standards, and, and helps with the how to teach, which is support and development, uh, we knew we needed to identify equitable ways by which our standards could be used in the education space with a minimal amount of effort. And then we also needed to ensure that what we created uh, was not subjected to interpretation by others outside of our department uh, who would gather those standards and then, uh, you know, do something beyond what our, our original intent was. So currently our standards and the resources that we produce are located on our state education agency produced and supported website, georgiastandards.org. Uh, there somebody can find a copy of our standards, what we call our Georgia Standards of Excellence in a machine readable format. Uh, about a year ago, as, as Greg discussed, uh, we made the decision based on educational technology trends that we're witnessing uh, to make our standards available in a machine readable format. So now the Georgia Department of Education is an affiliate member of IMS Global and because of our understanding of CASE, we agree that standard and the use of OpenSALT, which is the tool that Greg discussed, would be the method by which we publish our academic standards in a machine-readable format. Now, we are assured that anyone using this machine-readable version of our GSEs located at case.georgiastandards.org has a trusted, consistent version of the standards specifically because each standard has a global, unique identifier, what we call a GUID, we know that standard is in its most exact form uh, and it's being distributed and used. Georgia is the first state in the nation to publish our standards uh, in this particular format. Our DOE ESSA plan calls for us to explore competency-based learning and so we're internally discussing what that um, Education 2.0, what version may look like. We do think, however, that we can document mastery by measuring both progress, process, and by collecting evidence of learning. We ask ourselves, can we assemble the necessary learning technologies seamlessly together using standardized processes that will allow us to measure and document a student's unique learning pathway so as to provide progress, process, and evidence of learning that's contained within an information-rich, portable learning record? The common denominator to this portable learning record, or micro-credential, is the machine-readable standard, and specifically the GUID that will allow for the specific standard, or in this case competency, being measured to have a succinct, accurate, trusted identifier. Thus, the implementation of CASE was critical to any thinking, and without it, the process is not doable. I'm showing you here a snippet of code behind a micro-credential that has the URI to the CASE GUID for a standard uh, for which a micro-credential badge has been earned. And so at the top of the screen, what you see is uh, computer science and specifically one of our standards associated with computer science. And then at the bottom in the box that I've got, uh, that is that GUID, and you see that that GUID is specifically attached to the URI, case.georgiastandards.org. And so somebody with potential access to that badge can basically peel back the layer and see access to the evidence that supports the alignment of that. So. Also, and germane to this common denominator conversation is the necessity of a common thread to tie together otherwise siloed, discrete systems in a seamless and transparent way that allow the use of learning technologies in the learning process without a negative impact. The schema that you see here represents Georgia's total learning architecture, or TLA, which is a theoretical roadmap that may lend itself to the use of learning technologies to promote and allow for competency-based learning and is personalized for a student. Note that in the upper left-hand corner, you see that CASE is one of the first and most necessary threads for this. The TLA process ends with the awarding of an information-rich micro-credential that adheres to the OBI, which is another IMS global standard to ensure that the credential is highly portable. 
Another advantage of CASE, and specifically the GUID, is the ability to crosswalk our standards and align two GUIDs to another. So now, the team of content developers for Georgia Virtual can align resources, and in this case, you're looking at CS resources, with resources that are aligned to a standard not produced by the Georgia Department of Education. Here, we're looking at either a code.org or maybe even Harvard CS50 resources that are aligned to the national CSTA standards. Uh, and because they're used and aligned in case, we can now align those with our CS standards. What this does, it allows us to create highly customizable lessons that are created using the best resources to learn of our competency, not just the best resources available to our Georgia standards. Um, and so with that, let's see, I'm going to see if I can pull up a really quick demo of what we think this might look like. And specifically, I'm going to show you how we think this badging process is going to uh, precipitate out and specifically how uh, CASE uh, integrates itself with this. So I want to share my screen. And I think I need to share monitor to you, everybody. Give me just a second. Let me get this out. Um, and I think what you're looking at now is uh, a code.org screen. And so let's imagine that we have a student uh, that's participating in one of our courses that actually is, is utilizing a code.org resource. And obviously, as I said, this is aligned uh, to one of the national CSTA standards. And so imagine that this child has gone through and completed a couple of, uh, of the lessons here. And now she's in a position where she wants to assert that a certain level of learning has occurred. What we have done is created a small um, Google app called I Did It. Uh, and you see this up here in the upper right-hand corner of my screen. Uh, and whenever I click this, um, this gives me the opportunity to say, hmm, I want to assert that I have done this. And specifically, you should see here that it has picked up two competencies. These two competencies align uh, to these Georgia standards uh, or competencies align to what these national standards are. And so whenever this particular child clicks the I did it, uh, what that does is it enables this child to gather evidence of their learning. And in background, we have a couple of systems, what we call a CAS server, that kind of whisks that information away and it takes it over here to a specialized server, uh, which I'm going to quickly refresh. And you'll see in just a second that it's picked up the fact that a child, in this case a student, has asserted a level of learning. Uh, and it's going to immediately allow us to kind of pair that up with one of the rubrics uh, which we have, which are aligned to our case standards, in this case, our Georgia Standards of Excellence, computer science. So give it a second, it's still spinning here, everybody. Here it comes. And so now we see that a child by the name of Sandy Deskin, who is who I was logged in, uh, has turned in a, a, a um, assignment just a few minutes ago, and it picks up two standards. And if I select this, uh, you're going to see very quickly um, that now a rubric has been assigned to this, and a piece of evidence, an evidence of learning, has been associated with that. And so now, secondarily, a teacher, if she so desires, uh, can, can view the evidence and say, I think this child meets the mastery or the expectations for that, that competency, uh, and the child also meets the expectations for that competency. And literally what happens now, once that is, is occurred, is that now a badge is issued. And, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to switch over here to my Badger account, and you'll see immediately that a badge has been created that allows us to say uh, that we have created programs that include loops, sequence events, uh, and conditionals. And here's what's so neat about this is that that snippet of code that I showed you earlier, it is, it's viewable in a JSON package that's behind this. But what's really neat is that this badge, if I take this standard and I select it, I can come to our OpenSalt server and specifically say, is there a standard um, to which this aligns? And certainly if I select and I paste this information and search for it, you see me, this is uh, the standard by which we were talking about. And over here, what we see is the specific and uh, unique reference identifier of that particular item uh, as it relates to that badge. And now if I were to come back over here and specifically look inside of this badge, I literally would be able to see the components, the subcomponents of that, uh, and find out that specifically you see here on my screen that that item and specifically that uh, GUID uh, now specifically lines up to that badge. And so now what we've got is a highly portable uh, learning record document that specifically has the evidence of the standard uh, and other components baked into that. So, um, and that's it. Um, Kara, I'll pass it back over to you. 
Okay, thank you. And now we're going to turn this over to um, Anne at Houston. Thanks, Kara. Um, and thanks, Keith. That was that's that looks wonderful, and and I'm so glad that you guys have been um, advancing forward in that direction. And HISD is 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 trying to reach that same goal of uh, um, having those automatic recommendations for assignments and and be able to do that same kind of thing. So um, I'm an IT manager with Houston ISD. And Jeez, help. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we lost you for about the last three minutes. So if you could just go back and start over. Thank you. Okay. So, um, but you can hear me okay now? Yeah, yes? you're great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, I, well, I'm from Houston ISD. I'm an IT manager, and we uh, had an integration of a learning management system, and so we were we were having some issues, uh, and so our purpose all along has been to um, work with our Texas Education Agency and IMS Global to create a framework for the publishing of the TEKS, which is the Texas Learning Standards. It's in short, it's uh, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, and have one authoritative agent to manage and publish um, our learning standards in Texas. So the issue came from our TEKS, our learning standards, being published in a static format. This is just the standard HTML page from uh, TEA's website when they were publishing the TEKS, and of course the chapter number is up at the top, um, and they were written in outline form, but they were static. Um, and so they were left up to the interpretation of various vendors um, who would extract these learning standards and publish them in their own proprietary way. Um, and so that's an example of, of how they looked on the website. This is an example also at the bottom of how they are um, go through revisions. And so, you know, when we have these revisions, people were getting confused. So in this example, it would be, you know, do we call these the 2012 TEKS or do we call these the 2013 TEKS? That was causing some confusion. Um, here's another example where we had, you know, the exact same learning standard, but it was called different things. So this particular learning standard was um, rounding decimals to tenths or hundredths. And so um, in this case, it's uh, on the left, it's called 2.C, but on the right, rounding decimals to tenths is called 1.5.2.C. So you can see how that's left up to interpretation, um, how those are labeled. Um, just within Houston ISD, we had things called um, by different names, depending on which document you were looking at. So this was through Academic Benchmarks, our third party that publishes the GUIDs um, for our learning standards, and this was MA.89.5A, um, whereas our Secondary Curriculum and Development, their uh, master course documents, we're calling it ALG 1.5A, and then, you know, in EdPlan, our assessment platform, um, it was 111, it was, you know, called by the chapter number in Texas Education Code, uh, C.05.A. So you can see that's the exact same learning standard. It's solving it linear equations, but it was called various names, which really caused confusion, confusion between digital systems. So we uh, were constantly looking at trying to create crosswalks to, to have these systems communicate with one another, uh, just to try to align uh, and adjust to this variety of interpreted curriculum. And your audio disconnected again. And we're still not hearing you. Through IMS Global uh, yeah. called Case. Your audio disconnected on the last slide, slide 28. So if you could just go back. I'm so sorry. It's okay. 
I can't believe that. Okay. Um, so our effect, uh, the effect is basically, you know, it, it, it incurred huge costs because we were constantly having to go back and realign and find crosswalks um, to interpret the different formats from all the different vendors who had interpreted the TEKS in their own proprietary format. And so versioning was always an issue too. We couldn't tell which version they were using and interoperability was just not seamless as it should be. Are you hearing me okay? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So TEA contracted with a company called Trinity Education Group, um, and PCG was a huge help in this also. They helped pilot their open salt program with us, uh, and the open salt uh, platform is what you saw earlier in this presentation to create uh, a whole new machine readable version of the TEKS. Um, according to this new case, Competencies and Academic Standards Exchange format. Um, and so you've already heard about CASE, um, our new IMS global format. So this is kind of what we're aiming for um, with our new format. We uh, are hoping to enable personalized learning um, by having our cloud decision tool, which you know resides within our LMS. It doesn't always have to reside within your LMS, but you're gonna have various vendors um, that bring in a different assessment, a different curriculum, and this information goes into our data warehouse and we want it to feed back into our cloud decision tool to help recommend content for students. Um, this is another graphic of what it might look like, but as you're teaching the curriculum, it goes through uh, and you, of course, uh, the case helps inform making a decision about that, which also uh, goes to the assessment, which also feeds back, and you can make a decision to go back to the curriculum or uh, and reteach or move on to the next portion of your curriculum. And this is, of course, what it looks like on the larger scale. You know, you'll have various assessment platforms and various curriculum providers, and you have your cloud decision tool. And um, all of these things are now communicating openly and seamlessly because of the new case standard. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Texas Education Agency, uh, Monica Martinez, who's going to talk a little bit more about things from their perspective. Thank you. Um, can you can all hear me? Yes, Monica, thank you. And you have okay. control of the screen. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I actually don't have any additional slides. I just wanted to provide a little bit more information from the state perspective, and then I will um, hand it off to our State Board of Education chair to talk a little bit more about the work that they um, have engaged in from a policy perspective. Um, so as Dr. Booth mentioned, we um, heard from districts that there are, were a variety of challenges as districts look to incorporate uh, digital content into instruction. Um, in Texas, we've got over 1,200 independent school districts and charter schools, which means that there is the possibility that there are 1,200 different ways of um, interpreting and labeling the standards, as was mentioned. Um, so in addition to the need to make sure that all of our school districts had um, information that they could use consistently. Um, we wanted to make sure that we address this issue of versioning that was mentioned by Dr. Booth. Um, the State Board of Education does uh, update, review, and revise their standards on a regular basis, which means that in any given year, we might have a set of standards that is being implemented, a set of standards that has been adopted but not yet implemented, um, and then there are some issues around um, which standards we assess or which version of the standards we assess at any given point in time. And so um, the work that we have done to provide these machine-readable standards, we expect will help districts and will, will help us to be able to quickly and easily turn on and off different versions of the standards depending on when districts need to implement those standards. Um, as was mentioned and as you saw in the framework, we do have our standards are adopted into administrative rule and so they do follow a standard format or taxonomy. Um, what we have done is worked with our um, contractor to convert that into structured data um, and created metadata that is directly tied to each one of our student expectations, which is what um, we call the standards. 
This information was recently made available in a content management and development system um, that we have at the state level. Um, as was mentioned, it is called the Texas Gateway. And this is a platform that districts can access where we have a variety of courses, content resources for both educators and students. Um, but we are also now housing all of the um, machine readable standards. The one step that we've also included um, that we're pretty excited about is we have pre-kindergarten guidelines in Texas that are aligned to our essential knowledge and skills. And those pre-kindergarten guidelines are also being um, written into machine readable standard format so that our, our um, pre-kindergarten programs will have access to the same information. Um, we are using it ourselves to, to help districts to navigate the resources that we have within the Texas Gateway. Um, but I think most the, the piece that folks are most excited about are that um, districts can go in and consume um, the machine readable standards and use them in their own different platforms as was um, described by Houston Independent School District. And then um, the more recent step that has been taken is that the State Board of Education, it will from uh, this point forward require any publisher who wishes to be considered um, to have their instructional materials adopted by the state of Texas will have to use these machine readable standards. And um, it is our hope that this will will go a long way in helping to facilitate um, that common um, understanding and that, that same language so that districts, any um, of the, the State Board of Education's adopted instructional materials will already use the machine readable format, um, which we hope will not only be a, a cost savings, but will help districts to better integrate all of the different resources that they might be using. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to uh, Mrs. Bohort, and she can talk a little bit more about the, the policy aspect of the work that we're doing in Texas. Is it, can everyone hear? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I'll do this very quickly. Um, uh, I became aware of this particular problem because the board decided to hold a series of roundtables. Our first annual roundtable was on educating the digital generation in 2015. And in doing um, the, because we were making such a transition from hardback textbooks about that time to um, digital textbooks. In 2014-15 uh, school year, we had 41% of our purchased uh, instructional materials were digital. Um, however, the following year, that jumped up to 74% were ordered either completely or partially digital. So when you have that big of a transition, it seemed very timely on the board's um, part to have a, a round, learning roundtable discussion on, on the implications of that and, and some difficulties and barriers that we might need to come over. And in doing the research for that roundtable, I came across articles like in Ed Week uh, back in 2013, they had an article that talked about um, how interoperability was such a major problem, problem into attaining the digital promise, and that is the uh, ability to curate quality content um, effectively and efficiently tied to state standards for teachers in order to prepare lessons as part of that. And of course, to be able to tie information directly to students' um, competencies and that sort of thing, as we saw aptly demonstrated by the Georgia group previously. And so interoperability became something that was, uh, came to focus and Dr. Booth and assembled quite a few people to uh, begin to work on the need for those kinds of things and to make the case that this is something that we needed to do uh, on a state basis work. Um, and then, of course, staff through Monica's direction worked, uh, got involved and in, in, uh, worked that together to make that all happen. And it took, a, I believe, Monica, it, was it a couple of years for us to get, if I'm remembering, all together? Yes, it's been about two years. About two years. Um, and so um, so what I would recommend 
because we have made the uh, big step on the board of requiring that if you're going to ask the State Board of Education to approve instructional materials for um, to be on our list, that you need to conform to using this open standards architecture. And uh, we feel like this is going to make a huge change uh, and is actually nudging the industry in a positive way. In addition to that, Monica's staff put together a survey um, that we call the report on interoperability and ease of use that we issued as part of our proclamation in 2019 that, and we also have it in 2020 where we'll be getting uh, the material submitted this year and, and then some material submitted next year will both also include surveys. So we can kind of assess from those surveys, what is the state of the ind industry towards interoperability? Um, because there are other moves toward interoperability of interest. Uh, one roster is another area that we hope to head at some point, but I don't want to get off into that right now. But um, that is uh, kind of gives you an idea about where we've headed. One of the things that I think is helpful is, is if you can, if for those of you making the case towards your policymakers and folks who might be might need to get involved in things like this initiatives to go, go forward is to be sure that you're explaining interoperability in a way that um, the non-technical person can understand what you're saying. And so I found it helpful to be able to use Dr. Booth's illustration of this by using the ISBN numbers in a library. Because if you walked into a library and you had no ISBN numbers, you would have no idea how to find the content or the book that you're looking for. It would be very confusing. And, um, and it's similar to that and it gives a visual and people, whenever I give that illustration, say, oh, I see what you're saying. And um, that's very helpful because when you're trying to make the case for these technical the need for these technical things, it can be very confusing to people and you need to bring it down to a level that they understand what you're talking about and give them a visual picture. And I found that very useful. And that's about it. Okay, great, thank you. And next we're gonna turn the presentation over um, to um, Smarter Balance and TCG. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brent, if you're on, I'll do just a quick Preamble. Uh, this is Joshua sure. Marks with Public Consulting Group, and I'm the co-chair of the CASE Task Force uh, that that put the standard together, along with Brandon, who's also on the call. Um, there were two customers of ours who were really key drivers for making this happen. One was Houston Independent, as Greg mentioned, who asked us to try and figure out this common alignment problem for connecting our assessment platform and their learning management system. And the other was the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortia, who had asked us to uh, build and maintain their digital library and also do a separate project uh, that they called the Content Specification Explorer. And this got into the details of the, uh, the specification for the assessment and how it aligns to uh, the common core in the case of uh, Smarter Balance. So Brent, uh, with that, maybe uh, you can take it from there and then I'll, I'll present how we uh, uh, solved your problem using the Open Salt tool. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, um, for those who are, of you who aren't familiar, uh, Smarter Balanced is uh, a consortium of um, multiple states, depending on how you count, somewhere between 12 and 14, uh, that have uh, combined resources to develop high quality student assessments. And these include uh, the uh, summative year end assessments that everybody's familiar with, but uh, in, for to ourselves, we consider the interim assessments that inform teachers about their students' uh, progress to be much more important because they come in time to actually uh, help influence uh, instruction in a, in a positive way. So uh, the assessments from the beginning have been aligned to the Common Core State Standards 
and we uh, also have our own uh, content uh, test content specification. And the content specification is essentially the same standards that you see in the Common Core written up, except that we organize them and cluster them in ways uh, that are conducive to measuring uh, students. So uh, the Common Core was deliberately organized uh, to be optimized around how you should teach or the order in which you might teach uh, particular skills, but we have skills that depend on each other, and, uh, and as we're measuring those skills, we can actually uh, optimize a test by saying, well, since this skill depends on this other one, uh, if we uh, measure student competency in this way, then we're able to project uh, their competency onto other related uh, skills. And so our content specification is exactly that. It's a, it's a reorganization of the very same standards uh, that is optimized for the way we write tests. And then associated with that, then we have our item specifications. Those item specs uh, indicate to somebody who's writing a test question, which is what we call an item, uh, what uh, they are supposed to be measuring and how to go about measuring that. So, for example, we might have an item specification that's associated with the writing skill uh, of their ability to um, uh, make a, uh, an argument about the perspectives of uh, two different authors whose uh, information that they've read or something like that. So the item specification would indicate you need reading passages on the same subject from multiple authors. Uh, you need to um, structure the question in this way, and it should have a rubric uh, about how to score the student's assignment in this particular way. And so that would be an item spec, and that drives uh, the writing of all of our assessment questions and then each question then is aligned back to that content specification. That content specification is aligned back to the common core. And that way when we report our test results, you can interpret those according to all of those uh, alignments. Each question and then a cluster of questions and so forth, all projecting back to the student skills that were in the original standards. So in order to uh, do this, this is all done initially in a um, partly manual, partly automated process but all based on proprietary standards and a whole bunch of spreadsheets. And, uh, and we wanted to open this up so we can publish these, like many other people have said, same kind of motivation. We want to publish these standards in a way that uh, is machine readable uh, by uh, the developers of curricula, by the developers of reporting systems and so forth. And we also want to be able to maintain these uh, our, our content specs, our item specs, and any updates to uh, standards that are inbound uh, using the same framework. So we turned to uh, PCG, who are already helping us on our digital library, which is uh, intended to support formative assessment. They're helping us tag the formative assessment content uh, according to these standards. We turned to them and said, can we represent our content, uh, our, our, our content standards in such a way that they'd be machine readable. The case uh, standard was uh, under development at the time, and it turned out to be a perfect match for us. So uh, Joshua, maybe I'll hand back to you as we go through the little uh, demo we have here. Yeah, so I'm gonna go and share my screen now, and uh, Brant will talk about these connections between uh, the content specifications and the item specifications. Uh, what you see here at case.smarterbalance.org is Smarter Balance version of the thing that Georgia showed you uh, uh, at their site. It's, it's their version of Open Salt, and, and you know this is the public view. Uh, and as you can see, that they've published the co their uh, view of the Common Core standards, their content specifications, uh, and uh, their item specifications. So. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll start here with the Common Core in math, and you can talk about uh, how yeah. this is structured and, uh, and all of this drive. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, what Joshua is showing you here, and by the way, this is a public site, case.smarterbalance.org. You can go play around with it if you want to as, uh, yourselves and, and get into all these. So we're looking at the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics uh, uh, represented in the case format. And, uh, and as we uh, look down there, then we're looking at grade six, and this is a particular uh, standard that we're going to uh, work from. So uh, uh, grade six, uh, geometry, A1, find the area of right triangles, other triangles, and so forth. And, uh, and so then what we can do then is we can say, okay, great, this is uh, how that's rendered in 
uh, the common core. And over there you can see matched from on the side. That's a relationship to, uh, and then we've, we've got another standard identifier there, m.g6.c1g and so forth. And, uh, and that's where Joshua is going now. Now we've just jumped over into the Smarter Balanced Content Specification. So uh, we're looking at uh, this um, organization, M stands for math, uh, G6 is uh, grade six, C1G, that is claim one. Our, our, our um, uh, assessments are all organized into claims and targets. And so this is claim one, which is uh, in the concepts and procedures area. And then uh, target H, which happens to be this particular standard. Now we have on the suffix something that looks familiar there, 6.g.a.1. On the suffix of our smarter balance content spec identifiers, we include uh, the uh, common core corresponding identifier. And then if you look there on the right hand side, we have the statement, uh, which should look familiar because it's an exact quote from the common core. And down below to confirm that, you can see it's an exact match of uh, common core standard 6.g.a.1. So, uh, so we, we're just showing you that here's uh, a reorganization, but it's the same information, and all this information that you're seeing here through the GUI is also machine readable. So a system could trace that whole pattern through and say, okay, this Smarter Balance standard aligns to this common core standard. Now what we're going to do is jump over to the uh, item specification that's associated with the same thing and, uh, and find out how would we go about assessing uh, this particular uh, skill. And so now we're looking at the grade six mathematics item specification for claim one target H. That's the C1TH, that's claim one target H. And you can see that uh, we actually have in this target H uh, a set of skills uh, that we're measuring. And then uh, Joshua, if you'll expand the item writing and scoring guidelines, we'll just actually look over just a little bit of the information that we would be providing to a test item writer here. So we have the statement of the skill uh, that we're trying to assess. Uh, then we have uh, the evidence that's required to show that uh, the student actually has achieved that particular skill. And then in our general item information, uh, we've got information about, okay, what's an allowable stimulus material? Um, what tools might that we use? And this is where we get into, is this going to be a multiple choice question? Is this an equation response where they respond with an equation? Is this a, um, uh, a written, uh, we, we have essay questions both in math and English where uh, students are in, expected to interpret their results. And so all of that detail of uh, what an, uh, an item writer would use is all encoded here. But uh, in addition to this being guidance for those item writers, now that we've got it published in a structured form that's easily accessible, we could also provide that same information to a, a teacher who's saying, my student got this question wrong. What was the, when the, when the uh, author wrote this question, what were they thinking of? What were they trying to uh, measure? And, uh, and by reading this item specification, they can get an idea of that. Or a curriculum writer, again, could say, okay, this is the skill that we're trying to teach. Uh, let's look at how it's going to be assessed so that we can get insight into uh, what um, people are driving at. So all that information, which was previously published, we've published all of our stuff in open form, but it's in these PDFs that are buried eight levels deep on our Smarter Balance website now are in this machine readable form and, and an appropriate uh, reporting system or, or uh, content system or, or teacher support system can uh, present that material in context uh, because the relationships between the, the assessments and the curriculum uh, can be represented in machine readable form. Joshua, anything to add to that? Uh, just that every element of this taxonomy is an item in the case format, is publicly accessible, and has a uh, what's called a URI, a universal resource identifier or link to find this thing. So if you mm -hmm. want to reference this example question uh, in, in any published work, you simply link to this URI, and that's really the key power uh, of cases, a state like Georgia or Texas can publish its standards, an assessment vendor can use those standards to create an assessment specification, uh, and uh, everybody can reference the appropriate uh, 
identifiers for either the measured skills in the case of the assessment or uh, the, the learning expectations in the case of the state. Um, and that's yep. the power of case, is it really underpins all of the IMS global specifications, uh, most particularly LTI and common cartridge, where you tag content or assessments uh, with learning objectives. It's never been defined how exactly you do that, and now it's been well defined. Thank you, Joshua. So uh, I do have a summary slide here, but uh, I think we better jump over that because we've only got 10 minutes left and one more person to present. So uh, thank you all. Adam, I'm giving you the ball. Adam, you're muted. Apparently, I'm, 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 I've been muted. Oh, can you, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yes, we hear you. Yours. Okay, one, wonderful, wonderful, okay. So I'm going to um, try to do present. Uh, okay, sharing my screen. Okay. So um, just going to present a couple slides. Um, so what I want to do is talk about um, cases a very fundamental building block, as Joshua mentioned, to several standards. Uh, he mentioned common cartridge. There's a new standard um, that's probably days from being released called LTI Resource Search, um, or, or if not days, then a couple weeks, um, that is for searching learning object repositories uh, using many different criteria, but the most exciting one is to be able to search LORs um, via um, case IDs, so you have unambiguous references to learning goals. So um, what is this API? Um, this is really the enabler of just the right resource for each student and each skill. This has always been the vision of personalized learning, but unless you have an unambiguous way to talk about a learning objective, that's quite difficult to do. Um, and so what this does is takes this unambiguous reference to learning objectives, but, but other metadata on resources, and gives you a way to access it through an API. So what is this standard? Well, it's the REST calls for resource searching. It's the resource metadata, how do you describe every resource? And then supplementary definitions of certain structures, so things like learning objectives. So this is actually the first time that uh, educational resource metadata um, has been standardized uh, in, in a very practical way. Um, so this is, this is really quite a big deal. There is a standard called schema.org um, that embedded the LRMI work, and we've taken all those attributes. Um, but we've added some attributes. And the most exciting attribute that we've added is, of course, um, this unambiguous representation of a learning objective through case. So I'm not going to go through all of these different um, <clears throat> these different attributes. I will say that uh, some of the more interesting ones are the the fact that you can have a web link or an LTI link. So we build upon LTI, hence LTI resource search. The educational audience is all these enumerated types that that uh, IMS already has. Uh, we do uh, age range instead of grade, so it internationalizes as well. And of course, the most important thing is the learning objective. So what I want to do is show, okay, as a practical matter, how do you find these learning objectives to search for? I was very pleased to see the example uh, that was shown of looking for for um, uh, 6.g.a.1. So I'm going to actually switch over to um, I'm going to switch over to. Uh, the case repository, this is out on opensalt.net, and here I am on 6.g.a.1, and I'm just going to grab, I can either grab the full URI, or I'm going, I can grab uh, just the GUID as part of it. One of my suggestions for OpenSalt is that this be shown as a separate property, but either way, either of them are this wonderful, unambiguous reference. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to pop over to my search client. By the way, this is an open source search client. I'm going to actually paste this in the, um, uh, I, at the end, I will paste this inside um, 
the, uh, the chat window. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to search two different lures with this uh, little utility for resources. So I'm actually going to search Novation. Novation is one of the other learning object repositories along with uh, Safari Montage that is, uh, is supporting this new standard. Uh, and so I'm going to call a little script that, that uses the credentials against Novation. And you can see what we're doing is we are searching for the 6.g.a.1 and we get seven resources back from them. Um, now, now, bear with me on this. This is, a, this is a command line utility. It's intended to show developers, if you're a developer with an assessment tool or maybe an LMS, it's intended to be a very small like code sample of how you would do this search. And I'm going to make the same search against OpenEd for this, the, the URI for 6.g.a.1. And you can see we actually get quite a few. Um, 6.g.a.1 is my favorite standard. Uh, and we actually get quite a few matches here of relevant, um, of, of relevant resources. Actually, we actually have 226.g.a.1 resources. Um, so that's the core of what I wanted to show you, and I'm going to turn it back over to um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Jill, and I am going to paste the link for that um, that uh, open source uh, command line utility uh, for you guys to use, especially those of you that are developers. Thanks so much, Adam, and to all of our presenters today. We appreciate your sharing a wealth of information about uh, competencies and academic standards exchange from how our states can implement uh, machine readable standards to how implementing those machine readable standards are useful to others once they are available uh, to now how those resources are going to become available through uh, new standards that IMS Global uh, will be soon making available. For more information on CASE as well as on <clears throat> all things related to K-12, including our state educational agencies, we have links for those available. You can see those on uh, the screen now. And also, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, we want to encourage you to join us for our next webinar, which is upcoming on, uh, on this Wednesday. Uh, this is another K-12 webinar that's being presented by uh, Gwinnett County Schools and Metropolitan School District of Wayne Township. Um, and you can learn more about what's going on with personalized learning. Uh, we hope you'll sign up now and register. Even if you're unable to attend on Wednesday, we encourage you to register because you'll have access uh, to the recording of the webinar later. Uh, so thank you very much. We appreciate your being with us today and hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.